I will, God willing, always continue to carry out my task and my responsibilities of promoting peace, tolerance, justice and compassion to the corners of the world. I will continue to tell all people that in order to be relieved of the pain and suffering that we face today, we must adopt true justice and equality. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the first ever book launch of Majlis Khudam al UK. Now we're incredibly honoured and excited to present to you the book The Great Western Revival Addresses of His Holiness Hazrat Mizam Sur Ahmed, may Allah be his helper. Now in the next half an hour or so, we'll be giving you our lineup all in the hope to get you to purchase the book, read it and also spread it in your locality. And as always, we want you to engage with us during this launch, after the launch as well. Tweet at us, use the hashtag Great Revival or message us on Instagram. This book is now available for pre-order. You can head over to waterstones.com and place your order right now. The Great Western Revival is all about peace and how to establish peace. We all know how important establishing peace has become in the past but especially right now. But before we go any further, we actually went to the British public to see how they reacted to this book, The Great Western Revival. Asalaamu Alaikum guys, we are right now in Wimbledon, right outside Waterstones, where this book, The Great Western Revival by His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, is now actually available for pre-order. And why are we here today? We're gonna to be showing the people in Wimbledon some of the quotes from this book. And we wanna find out would they be willing to read this book? Let's see what they have to say, let's go. We seek to wipe away the tears of those who are in pain. We've got more in common than we don't have. Most things are actually. So I do agree with that. It's not about what you say you are, it's about how you live. Your, okay. your, 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 your actions should show how okay. you live. I mean, you're absolutely right. So words, our actions speak louder than our words. Whether it comes to Muslims, Christians, Christians, we're all from the same we brotherhood. All, we all believe in one God. Exactly. And that's what we should all share. Okay. The connection of one God. And we should all come together and work for one good purpose. Absolutely. Because there's more in common that we don't have in common. <laughs> that's the and one. Unfortunately, sometimes the only way society works is by divide and conquer. And the message doesn't get up. The message is love. The reason why we showed you this video today yes. is because the message that you listened to yes. was from uh, the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who is a caliph. Okay. In Islamic terms, that means a yeah. spiritual head, yeah, like you might have a pope in yeah, the Catholic yeah, Church, for example. Khalifa, and then I've studied yes. more, more in Spain, I know, I know <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, he actually has a book which is now available for pre-order in Waterstones, okay. which is talking about basically what we spoke about today. Yeah. How can we instill community cohesion, love between all of us? And today we would like to give you that book. Even though it's available for purchase, we want to give this to you for free. Poor nations must not be looked down upon. Rather, we should consider them as part of our family, our brothers and sisters. Yeah, I think we do. I think we need to stop all this secularism. I think everybody, like at the end of the day, it's one religion. It's, you know, everybody, you know, as my understanding of someone coming into this religion and stuff, that there was only one last prophet in this, who was the prophet Muhammad yep. and he was the sealed nectar and that one day a messiah would come Absolutely. and um, according to the teachings of the uh, Ahmadi community which I know I'm quite familiar with because my wife's Pakistani <laughs> okay. and um, I know a lot of Ahmadis um, that he's already been uh, but even if some people don't believe that we're just one of us so we should all Absolutely. unite as one of us Absolutely. Day and work together I really really like your approach that you're so willing to be cohesive instead of being consumed by materialism and a desire for power Every nation, whether rich or poor, must prioritize the peace and security of the entire world above all else. I myself am, am a practicing Jew. Okay. Uh, I mean, from watching that video, I can very much 100% agree and relate to its messages. Um, I do think it's realistic. I do think it's achievable. It is a question, though, of us just working, uh, you know, different communities working together uh, along uh, the same ethos and just educating people to 
be better to themselves and be better okay. to each other. All right, guys, alhamdulillah, we've spoken to a number of people who seem to be very interested and quite curious about this book right here. And then we've given it to them. And now the only question remains is, why haven't you got yours yet? It's available now on thegreatrevival.co.uk or obviously in Waterstones for pre-order. We would love to see you get this book, give it a go, and even drop a comment below to see what you learnt, let us know what you've learned about it. Until next time, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah and peace be upon you all. Now, of course, the Khulafa of the Ahmadi Muslim community have been given God-given insight. And it's the same with His Holiness, Hazrat Mizar Masur Ahmad, Khalid from Masih Al-Khamis, may Allah be his helper. It's um, a pleasure to be part of this broadcast where this wonderful and uh, uh, book uh, filled with so much knowledge, which is a collection of the speeches of His Holiness, I, is being published for the first time and I in my position as a press secretary of the Amdi Muslim community have had the opportunity to serve under the direction and guidance of Hazrat Khalifa al Masih for a number of years and from the very first day that I've had this opportunity I've seen how there is so much wisdom and knowledge in everything that the Khalifa of the time says at the same time, there are times where he will give guidance or he will give instructions or he will make a prediction or a statement about the state of the world that is contrary to what you had imagined or what you read in the newspapers. And this is something that initially used to take me a little bit by surprise as well. But over time you get to see that the Khalifa of the time is not biased in any way like the media will always have its own direction or agenda. Politicians will always have their agenda. But His Holiness looks at the whole picture of what society is. And he has only one driving force, and that is the teachings of Islam, which are based on justice. And it is based on those teachings that he guides and he instructs. And whether that is in, your, in my personal life, sometimes he will guide me and to millions of Ahmadis around the world, or whether it is in terms of ensuring and trying to try his utmost to ensure the stability and peace of the world. I remember when I just joined uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community as a full-time worker, I was, uh, once I took a, a, a report to His Holiness about Ramadan and how they were planning, it was a government policy at the time, to try and make um, children who are fasting that, uh, 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 give them an allowance so that they wouldn't have to, uh, to take their exams. And I when, I, when I saw this story, was very naturally appreciative that this is a wonderful gesture of the government, that they know that there are Muslim students in this British country and they're giving them the opportunity to defer their exams. And so I took this story to His Holiness and reported it to him. And I have to say, I was amazed at his response. His Holiness said that this is completely wrong. He said that, on the one hand, if there are children or young teenagers or, uh, or, or young adults who wish to fast, then, and they feel they are able to fast, then they, the, the true spirit of the fast determines that they should live their lives as they normally would without getting any special treatment. However, and he said this is the dangerous point, he said that this policy implies that it is necessary for children and for young students to fast, which is inherently against the teachings of Islam, which has given permission to children, that they, there is no need for them to fast. It is only when you become an adult and you are becoming fully mature of body and mind that you are required to fast. And so His Holiness said that this will actually encourage the belief that Islam is a religion of extremism where nothing could be further from the truth and so he, he, he instructed me to write this to the newspaper and we did uh, immediately and it actually was given a lot of coverage and uh, considered as one of their best articles and, uh, of, uh, of that month. On a much wider scale another example is in 2016 Donald Trump was soon to be elected as the President of the United States. There was about a month left before his election. 
and um, His Holiness was in Canada at the time and he was asked in an interview by Peter Mansbridge, who was a very renowned journalist in, in, in Canada, that President uh, or the, the candidate as he was at the time, Donald Trump, is, is saying that he's going to bring a Muslim ban. He is saying he is going to uh, uh, make very, very harsh policies which could impact minorities in a discriminatory way. What do you say to this? Upon this, His Holiness said that if he is elected and if he tries to bring these policies, then His Holiness said that he feared that there is a chance of a civil war in the United States. And I remember with this moment very, very vividly, the journalist who was extremely experienced he took a step back, uh, on his face you could see that he was quite startled by the comment. All of us who were around, we were wondering as well, that did His Holiness actually mean civil war? It seems so unlikely. And if he tried to implement whatever he is saying, then I fear that there is going to be a big civil war. Civil war? Yes, of course. So nothing that could be in our field of thought or vision given that America had been uh, considered the most stable country or one of the most stable countries in the world for decades. But His Holiness had said it and later on, I asked His Holiness some time later, actually a few years later, about this comment. And he said that at that time, it was not something that he had thought about before, that there is potential for a civil war or for the nation to become so unstable under the government of, uh, of Donald Trump. But he said at that time something inside him or something from God uh, guided his tongue to say those words. And it was very interesting that at the time a lot of people who saw those comments were surprised and a lot of people would have thought that this is impossible. And some people did express their uh, views that this is uh, completely out of the realms of possibility. Yet we've, we look to the past four years, what happened, what transpired. Over time, that government did bring a series of measures that were discriminatory, that were inflammatory. Comments were made on a daily basis or tweets were published on a daily basis almost that sought to heighten that divide and heighten that tension. And what was the result? The result was what we saw on January the 6th in 2021 in America, where hundreds if not thousands of people tried to enter the Capitol forcefully, Capitol Hill, in a way that had not been seen since the time of the civil war in America. And it led to commentators, writers, politicians to say that if this is not the state of a civil war, then what is? And I can also say this, that His Holiness does, will not look back on the way his words were uh, fulfilled with any sense of pride that what I said came to rather it will be re a sense of regret that the warnings he has given about how we need to build a society based on justice, fairness, tolerance were not heeded and it led to the occurrences and we can only hope that nations and countries will come to pay heed to the message that inside this book that has just been published, The Great Revival so that future generations and future, and future times can be saved from the horrors that were seen and horrors far beyond that. Along with many of the predictions which His Holiness has made, there's been burning issues within the world which His Holiness has addressed and which we include within this book. For example, immigration. This has been a huge issue. Um, we've had Brexit, we've had walls being built, and it's not just in the newspapers, but day-to-day -day conversations at school, colleges, universities, or at the workplace. People ask a lot of questions about immigration. And within the book, Hazur has addressed this topic in a very balanced and wise manner. Not putting, putting the burden on any side, but addressing how we can reach a peaceful society and also celebrate immigration. So I just want to quote a few passages from the book where Hazur addresses both sides, the governments and society and why they should accept immigration and those people leaving um, countries which are full of war and violence, seeking a peaceful life, and also those people 
who are coming here, what their responsibilities are. Azul says, and I quote, Society should not reject genuine refugees who are suffering through no fault of their own. Society should not cast aside innocent people who only want the opportunity to live in peace and who desire to be good citizens and follow the laws of the land in which they live. The human race has progressed significantly, from hunter-gatherers to leaving footprints on the moon and even reaching for Mars. Yet despite this, there is mass unrest and disorder in the world. Political instability continues to spread. But what are the solutions to the issues we face today? From international relations and social justice to serving humanity and attaining inner peace. From an inspirational leader devoted to peace and justice. The words in this book are no ordinary words. They carry such wisdom as can breathe into nations a new spirit, bringing about a great revival. So the history of the Ahmadi Muslim community is full of promoting peace. If Islam means peace, then of course the revival of movement was to project and promote this very element in society. During a very fractured time, the Promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, he promoted and stressed the importance of peace um, in all levels of society. Social peace, religious peace, international peace. In fact, we know that during his time, wars weren't just increasing, conflicts weren't just spreading, but the nature of warfare reached very dangerous levels where weapons would now cause the most amount of destruction and killing as possible. And today that's you know grown to levels that we honestly cannot even comprehend. Now, just a day before his demise, the Promised Messiah Islam, wrote his last book. It was titled, A Message of Peace. Now this book laid the roadmap for how the world can establish lasting peace and all the different elements within it. This is his last book and his final message to the world. And from this book, it's very well established that the very focus of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been establishing world peace, peace amongst nations, amongst people, amongst religions. The subsequent caliphs of the Promised Messiah continued this project and to this day, as you will see from the book, peace has been a key element within the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and what the caliphs have been promoting. The Promised Messiah urged his community to be compassionate, to be peaceful to all peoples of the world. Right at the end of, um, uh, of his life, which was in 1908, he, when he traveled to Lahore, he was working on a masterpiece, and that masterpiece is titled Pegame Sullo, which means in English, a message of peace. That was a time, early 20th century, just the very first part of the, of the 20th century, when uh, a very vague sense of nationalism had begun, uh, had begun to emerge in not only India, but the whole of the world. We must remember it was a time, it was a build-up to the First World War. So it was very, uh, it's, it's a very, very important phase of history, not only of India, but of the whole of the world. Now we see that in India, the two major religions, Indians and Muslims, uh, had always lived together under different circumstances. There had been different rulers, there had been different circumstances that they lived under, but there always had been a, a, a sort of a tension that always kind of existed, a friction. What had happened by the early part of the 20th century is that the vague sense of nationalism that had begun to emerge, Hindus developed their own nationalism uh, or a sentiment of nationalism while Muslims had a different one to them. But the primary basis, the, 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 the pivot of this sentiment always remained on religion. It was religion that gelled them together within their own communities. So it was Hindus versus Muslims. Now this uh, significant message of peace that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi gave to both of the major nations of uh, India, i.e. the Hindus and the Muslims, was not published in his lifetime. He passed away in May 1908. Uh, the book was uh, published posthum posthumously and the lecture 
before even it got published, was actually read out in the Punjab University old campus. Well, there was only one campus at that time, but it was read in the whole of the Punjab University in Lahore. Punjab University Lahore being the intellectual hub of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, major newspapers covered the event. It was read out in June. Uh, people from all walks of life, especially from the intelligentsia, especially from the press, especially from the political circles, were there, both from the Hindu side and the Muslim side and the British rulers as well. I mean, the officials from the British bureaucracy being represented. They were there. The newspapers have reported that the, 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 the message of peace was read out and it was received with a lot of appreciation by both the Hindus and the Muslims. So it made a major difference and it could have made a major difference if the, if the advice was followed as it was given by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi so let's have a read at a short quote from the book, A Message of Peace, the last book written by the Promised Messiah In the very beginning of the book, he writes, and I quote, My countrymen, a religion which does not inculcate universal compassion is no religion at all. Similarly, a human being without the faculty of compassion is no human at all. Our God has never discriminated between one people and another. So this is just a very short quote and the book is full of um, steps and advice in establishing world peace. And when you read the Western Revival, you'll see that the same theme has been continued by Hazrat Nizam Masur Ahmed, His Holiness Khalif al Masih al-Khamis. Now the fifth Khilafat, Khilafat al-Khamisa, the Khilafat of Hazrat Nizam Masur Ahmed Sahib, may Allah be his helper, dawned at a time when Islam probably faced the worst challenge that it had ever faced in history. It was uh, the turn of the millennium, it was the turn of the century, and the atrocities of 9-11 were still fresh in the collective psyche of the whole of the world, especially the West, which had been apparently or allegedly been the target of the perpetrators of the 9-11 atrocities. Now, that was the time when Islam was totally seen as a, as a religion of violence. And Islam had been painted, the picture of Islam had been painted as if it only knew of killing and nothing else. So Islam, which actually meant peace, was now being seen as a religion of violence. And that was the time when Hazrat Khalifatul Masih V assumes, his, assumes office as Khalifatul Masih. And right from the very first day, he has been on the mission of calling the world towards peace and telling them how it can be established. It's not just a call of peace. It's actually a solution. It's actually a method. He, he explains, he has explained time and time again how it is to be obtained and how it is to be attained. Because you can't just tell the world we need peace. Everybody knows that. You have to tell how exactly do you propose and how exactly do you suggest the establishment of peace in the world? And that is where the message of Hazrat Khalifatul Masih the fifth is unique. And this is where it's different from not all other religions, but from all other sections of Islam as well. He, the message he has to give to the world is the fundamental message of Islam, starting from an individual circle, moving on to the, 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 the smallest unit of the society, which is the family, moving on to communities, moving on to nations, moving on to the international sphere. The message is of peace. And he, the way he's been explaining all of it from the Holy Quran, and the way it's been welcomed is just magnificent. So, you know how nations should decide issues between themselves, how a leader should decide between, or a person uh, in, in a position of influence, how he should decide or they should decide between two nations that come to them. So the advice is not only for communities, it's for nations, and it's for the people and for the bodies that are actually there claiming to, 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 to establish justice between the, the, the nations of the world. So the message is global. The message has been, all along, it has been the strongest message from any section of any religion. Now there's lots 
to discuss lots of quotes, lots of speeches by His Holiness. So we're going to hone in on quotes by His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masur Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, and see how they're so important and impactful. His Holiness has covered the aspect of peace from so many different perspectives, it's impossible to limit it into just a few quotes. But just by way of an example of a glimpse of how he has done this, I've selected a few quotes. So in one address, His Holiness covers this topic of inner and outward peace. And His Holiness says the following, that at a personal level, peace is something we all desire. Whilst at a broader level, it is something different nations and communities claims to aspire towards. However, what is peace and why do we need it? His Holiness says that in my view, there are two types of peace. There is outward peace and inward inner peace. There is outward peace and there is inner peace. Often at a superficial level, people can appear to be happy and content. Yet though they have outward peace, they remain bereft of inner peace. His Holiness continues to say that, In reality, until a person attains inner peace, the material comforts of the world are worthless. Simply put, the one thing money cannot buy is inner peace. This quote of His Holiness is so powerful and so relevant to our time today. And His Holiness in this address speaks about how there are nations which are so powerful, which are so wealthy. There are people who are enjoying the comforts and luxuries of life, who have many facilities in the developed world, for example. And their standard of living is very high as compared to many of the developing countries. Yet, the level of depression, according to statistics and surveys, is extremely high. The level of discontentment is very high. The level of domestic abuse is very high. So why is this the case then, that on the outward level they have all the trappings of the world, yet inside they are, many people are not content? It's clear from the, what we see in society. And so this is why His Holiness said, the one thing money cannot buy is inner peace. Inner peace is essential to gain as well as outward peace. And he explains that this is not only in the developed countries, but in many developing countries also there can be a lack of inner peace. This, if this is understood, this is so powerful, this is such a relevant thing because if we can understand the true secrets and mysteries and concepts of how inner peace can be obtained, it would actually lead to happiness on a local level. And this is what His Holiness explains. He says that to attain international peace, you first have to have local peace. You can't just begin all of a sudden with peace all around the world. The first building block is the home. It is the inner peace of every individual. Once you have the inner peace of an individual, his Holiness says that that peace would then be spread to his or her neighbours. And when he spreads it to his and her neighbours, it can then spread to the whole vicinity, and then it can spread to the city, it can spread to the country, it can spread to the workplace, to the schools, to your wherever you go. And that essentially, this building block, which you start from this level of inner peace, His Holiness explains, that when it builds up, that when you understand that concept of inner peace, which His Holiness explains, it develops into the ability to be able to connect internationally into international peace. And that is the secret to, inter to peace in the world, is that initial building block of individual inner peace. So His Holiness in one of his addresses, he gives something which is what we call the golden rule for peace. And it's something so profound but so difficult to implement. But His Holiness says that a golden principle given by the founder of Islam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad, is that a true Muslim should like for others what he likes for himself. And His Holiness goes on to explain that I believe that this simple and profound point, if acted upon, not just by Muslims, but by all people, is the means for everlasting peace in society. No doubt everyone desires peace for themselves and their loved ones, but most people will be lying if they claim that they want their opponents and competitors to have peace and to live with contentment. Now, His Holiness has given other examples in his own addresses and other places in how the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, everywhere in the world, even in countries like Pakistan, where there's state-sanctioned persecution, but also elsewhere like Africa, India, even in the UK and the West America, we selflessly, without wanting anything back, have established schools, hospitals, eye clinics, medical centers, all sorts of water wells, uh, model villages, where without looking at the religion, the color, the caste or creed of the person, we provide them with facilities and we provide them the means to stand up on their own feet, not to be dependent, but to take that away and not be reliant on us. And so this golden principle of a, not just a Muslim, but anyone liking for others what you like for yourself is a, such a profound principle of peace 
that at every level of society, whether it relates to economics, whether it relates to what we're going through now in the pandemic, um, how we distribute vaccines, whatever it might be, this principle really can break down barriers, establish mutual respect. Uh, but as has been mentioned by His Holiness, it's very difficult to implement. But this is a beautiful principle by Islam, outlined by the Holy Quran and Islam over 1400 years ago, which the world today can take lesson from and truly benefit from. So in several of His Holiness's addresses, not just one, he constantly explains this verse of the Holy Quran or verses of the Holy Quran from the opening chapter, Surah Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. And as I mentioned, not in just one, in several of his addresses, His Holiness has explained that this verse is central to the Islamic faith, whereby Muslims are taught that God Almighty is not just their Lord and protector and provider, but he is also the provider and sustainer of all humankind. He is the gracious, the merciful. And so irrespective of caste, creed or color, God Almighty fulfills the needs of his creation. His Holiness has applied this principle in many of his addresses. For example, he gave an address in Singapore relating to the economy or economics. And he says that actually, for God, there is no barriers. There are no countries. The resources are for everyone. So once a country fulfills the needs and of their own people, which they should, they should then share those resources with others because God doesn't discriminate when he gives things like his resources, his, the sun, the air, the wind. He even provides it to people who don't believe in him. His Holiness has applied this to justice. That when you are, when you, when in terms of international relations, in terms of forming alliances and forming deals with others, they should be done with this in mind: that you are fair and honest with all people. You don't discriminate between a person of color. You don't discriminate against someone who is a particular religion. Again, this principle is so profound, which His Holiness outlines: that God is Lord of all the worlds, meaning He is a Lord of even atheists. He is a Lord of Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, everyone. And He, we see in the world that He did not just provide resources to just Muslim countries. He provides resources to even those who don't believe in him. And so when we apply the concept of how to establish peace in the world, His Holiness explains, if we try to reflect these attributes of God, then we will see that we will have a much fairer world from every aspect, from the economy to justice to social matters. And so this is one way in which His Holiness has explained how we should try to establish peace in the world. So we hope you enjoyed the launch please do take out five minutes, head over to the Waterstones website and pre-order your book, order it for your family, your friends, and of course, benefit from it. Send any feedback um, you have, your thoughts, what inspired you, tweet at us at UK Muslim Youth, or you can email us at ishat at khudam.co.uk. We really hope, inshallah, in the future, we'll be releasing more books like this based on the great guidance and wisdom of His Holiness, Hazrat Mizam Surah Ahmed, may Allah be his helper. Jazakallah for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.